Hey guys and welcome back to a new video. In this video I have four security best practices for your Android app. And I would say it almost does not matter what kind of Android app you've built, at least one or two or even all of these best practices here apply to your app. And if Android security is actually interesting for you in general, aside from these four best practices, and you also want to understand how the Android operating system really works under the hood, then until Sunday, still early but discount on my brand new Android internals course, link down below. Best practice number one, if you need to somehow persistently save sensitive user data. The best example here is really uh, some kind of authentication token. So for example, you are uh, talking to some kind of REST API with your Android app because the user logged in in some way. They have a, an email, a password field. You send that to the backend server and the backend server typically replies with uh, some sort of token that you can then use from that point on to authenticate your requests. So this token is definitely needed client side and is also typically used in order to check, for example, if a user is still logged in. So you would check, is there actually a token saved? And is that token still valid? And if so, you would simply redirect the user directly to the uh, screen they would get to after being logged in. And the typical place to store such a token is just local preferences. So some people may use shared preferences for that. Some people may use the more modern data store API. Either of that is fine, but don't just store it in preferences. Don't just use the normal shared preferences API. Don't just use the normal data store instance in order to save that token. Yes, those preferences themselves are pretty safe. They are saved in your app's internal storage. So it means the, the isolated sandbox environment of your Android app where only your app can actually access the data and saves there. So also with the normal shared preferences or the normal data store, this token would normally not be accessible by other apps. But the thing is, these restrictions don't apply anymore if your app is running on a rooted device. So a device where other apps, possibly malicious apps, could be running as the root user because then there is no sandbox environment anymore. If a process is running as root on Android, then it has access to the full file system, including your app's internal storage. And therefore it could just read the token, it could make requests in your name or in the name of the currently authenticated user, and therefore cause a lot of harm with that token. Instead, if you need to save such sensitive data that would be very bad if other people would get access to that, make sure to encrypt it. Shared Preferences had an API provided by Google that also encrypts Shared Preferences. I think that's nowadays deprecated, which is why I made a video recently about how you can encrypt data store. So you can see this is the simple crypto manager class here that we've created in that video. I won't go through that in detail here. I will uh, link the video down below if you want to learn how you can encrypt your data store data. But in the end, the way that you should stick to is you should um, make use of the Android key store. So that's just the, um, a place where you can save your cryptographic keys that are needed to decrypt and encrypt data like that token. It's a safe place where also apps that are running as root can't simply access these keys. So make sure to use that key store make sure to actually um, have a function to encrypt data and decrypt data. These are the functions um, we then make use of here, for example, for these user preferences in order to write a custom serializer uh, that just uh, encrypts everything you write to your data store preferences and then automatically decrypts it again um, when, uh, when read from that again. And this is really safe. So even if another app is running as root, they could read your preferences, but if your token is encrypted, they can't do anything with that. And the way the Android OS is structured and how the actual hardware of Android devices is built like, the actual uh, bits and bytes of such a cryptographic key that can be used to decrypt such a file are actually kept in a so-called trusted execution environment or strongbox. So that's a separate hardware component completely isolated of the Android OS, which a simple root process from the Android OS can simply access. But as I said, that's something I go much, much more into detail in this new Android internals course. Coming to best practice number two, and that is a topic I get asked super often about, and that is if you have certain API keys in your app. For example, you have an Android app that needs to talk to some kind of weather API in order to get the current weather data. Common use case, and typically you just need such an API key in order to talk to that API, because these are often paid, these often require some, thought, uh, some sort of authentication. But the thing is, if you just put your API key here in code somewhere um, as a as a normal variable API key, and then you have it here, then this is super, super easy to extract if someone actually gets access to your APK, which anyone could get if you publish it to Google Play. So they would simply reverse engineer your app, try to extract back the original source code, look for the secret. Also, if you actually obfuscate your code with R8 or ProGuard, that's not safe at all. I also recently made a video where I actually showed a few uh, reverse engineering approaches of an already obfuscated app with um, R8 and ProGuard. So someone could simply get that API key, and then could, re could make requests in your name with your uh, possible payment plan of that API. So what's the way around this? Of course, you need to talk to that API in some way. Well, the absolutely uh, securest way you could stick to is 
to not store these keys in your app at all. Um, such sensitive data um, usually should not belong in a client app. So not on a website, on a front-end website, not on a, an, a normal Android app, an iOS app. Instead, such sensitive API keys should only be stored server-side. So you would need to implement your own controlled backend environment, your own hosted backend server that stores this API key. That's, of course, an environment only you have access to since the backend code is not distributed to some sort of users. And then instead of your app talking to that weather API, for example, directly, it would instead talk to your own controlled backend that hosts this weather API key. And then your own backend makes the final request to the weather API, gets the weather data, and forwards that to Europe again. Why is that much safer? Like, couldn't an attacker just go ahead and make the same request to your own custom backend? Well, yes, they could, but if you actually have your own custom backend, then you have a controlled environment. You can decide how a request gets handled, which requests are actually allowed in the first place. So if you just have an API key that grants access to, for example, a weather API with 10 different endpoints, but you only need one of these, then an attacker could, of course, get access to all of these 10 endpoints with a single API key. However, if you provide your own backend, then you can only expose a single endpoint to your app and then only that single endpoint can be accessed on your backend as a middleman from your app. And what you can do as well is you can, of course, implement certain restrictions. So you can say you, you add a rate limit, for example, that if a single Android app, a single client makes maybe uh, 10 requests or more than 10 requests in a single minute, which may be very unusual for your app's use case, then you could simply block those requests and not forward these to the weather API, which would then drain your quota. And that's actually the best possible solution for the vast majority of API keys. Now, there are certain types of API keys you can't easily just put on your own backend server and delegate all the calls to that backend server, which serves as such a middleman. But for example, think of a Google Maps API key. <laughs> Google Maps API keys are actually directly uh, coupled to a Google Maps view in your Android app. And in that case, the Google Maps SDK just abstracts away the, the actual API calls to Google servers that make use of the API key. So here you can't easily use your own backend as a middleman. But especially if you get such API keys from these big cloud providers, so AWS, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft, then there are lots and lots of ways to restrict these API keys server side. For example, um, that only requests are granted if they come from an app with a valid signature, so that if an attacker would um, take your API key and use it outside of your app, the uh, backend servers from Google, Amazon, and so on would detect that and would simply block that request. So if you really need to put an API key in your client app, as I said, sometimes that's possible, then restrict that server side. Other example would be if your app uses Firebase, uh, which is often meant to replace a backend that you don't need a database. So people um, have this typical Google services JSON file in their Android app, which by default would grant an attacker also access to your Firebase console, to your Firebase databases. But with Firebase, you have the option to also set up proper security rules for your databases that would again um, serve as a restriction for who can access that database if they have that Google services JSON file. Best practice number three is if you need to validate some sort of user data. So imagine you have a screen with a form with a certain text fields where the user can enter an email, maybe a password to register, and you want to enforce certain rules on those inputs. So the email must be a valid email. The password maybe needs to contain an uppercase, a lowercase character, or maybe a digit. Then if you have such validations, apply both server-side and client-side validation. So it's not enough to just go in your client side in your Android app and make sure that you have a check there that the user can maybe only enter valid passwords in the text field and otherwise can't hit the register button, but also make sure that you have the same checks server side on your backend. The client side checks are in the end just for usability so that the user sees, okay, these are actually inputs that I can enter and other inputs I can't. But an attacker knows more than the average user, so they wouldn't need to make the actual HTTP request to your backend via the actual Android app from you, but they could actually just scan which specific request was made when a user registers, and then they could just simulate a request from some kind of other environment, from Postman, I don't know, from some kind of program that can um, make HTTP calls. And then they can, of course, completely mutate that data in any way. They could send a wrong or an incorrect password to your server, like a password that just consists of a single letter, which would not be secure at all. And if your backend server does not validate this incoming data, whether that also um, fulfills the requirements for a valid password, well, then that one character password will be stored in your remote database because you did not validate it server-side. And of course, this is an example that won't lead to uh, an actual big problem, 
Because if an attacker really it goes that path to make a custom request and then sets a single character password, then they're already knowing really well what they are doing and they know that this is, wouldn't be secure for their account. But there are, of course, also other much more critical validations that you um, would need to make. For example, if you want to check whether a user is an admin user, then a client-side check does not do that. You could make the client-side check to just add some uh, UI elements to uh, show the user, hey, you're not an admin, you're not allowed to do this. But you, of course, also need to make uh, a proper server-side check whether the requesting user is actually an admin, because otherwise the request could again be mutated. And um, just because the client says they're an admin does not mean they are really an admin on the server-side. And coming to the last security best practice, number four, and that is if you have exported components in your Android app, make sure to add a permission to these. So what do I mean with exported components? On Android, we have a manifest. And in the manifest, we declare all such components. That's how Android calls these. A component can be an activity, a broadcast receiver, a service, or a content provider, which I all go over in the Android internals course in detail. And these components have this exported attribute, which for the activity, for main activity is true. If we now register maybe a service, so we create some kind of my service. My service, make this a service, override on bind, on bind, like this. And then want to register the service here in the manifest, then we do this by saying service, my service, and most people leave it like that. If you now want other apps, other processes to bind to the service and control its execution, so you want to establish an IPC, an inter-process communication, same thing for broadcast, if you want other apps to send broadcasts to your app, or if you expose a content provider, so maybe a database um, to, to other apps, then you can simply declare these components like this, but you would need to say, hey, this component is actually exported. So other apps are allowed to talk to the service. But the moment you set exported to true and don't do anything else, then that would mean that all other apps could send any form of commands to the service and could con completely control it, which is very often not what you want. Oftentimes you just want to enforce certain rules, which other apps can actually bind to the service, which other apps can send broadcast to your app, which other apps can access your app's database or content provider that you expose. And right now, someone could again just reverse engineer your app's code uh, could see, okay, there's actually um, a, a service declared, it's exported, but other than that, there are no security measures being applied. They could see what kind of commands your service actually expect, and then they could tamper with it. They could just uh, send commands from their app to your service. And for example, if you have a music playing app with a service that uh, implements music playback in the background, and that service has a command to stop music playback, then another app could just go ahead and send the stop command to your servers and music playback would suddenly stop and the user would not know why. They would blame Spotify for that or your music playing app. So if you want to avoid that and you only want to allow a select few apps to actually communicate with your service or your other components or launch your activities, then you actually need to declare a permission for the service. And what many people don't know is you can create your own custom permissions. You don't need to use the system permissions, which many of you probably know by users permission internet, for example. That is how we can say, hey, um, our app needs internet access. And we now use this permission. But this permission is just declared somewhere in Android system code. And we can really just declare our own permission. We can say we declare a permission without users that we call compil coding dot, okay, that's my encrypted data store project here. Or we could just say compil coding um, bind to my service. And we then go to our service and say we give it a permission which is exactly the permission we've declared before, bind to my service. And then only other apps that actually have a user's permission tag with exactly that permission, so other apps that say, I use this permission, only those apps can bind to your service. Now that's still not secure because a reverse engineer could of course still see, okay, that's the permission needed. I just need to add this to my manifest and then I can uh, talk to this app. But for that, you can set protection level, um, or what is it called? Um, oh, actually for this here, um, the protection level, which can be signature. So signature would mean um, the two apps, or if, if an app actually wants to talk to your service, it needs to be signed with the same key store. And obviously only you have access to that key store you have signed your app with, ideally. This is useful if you maybe just have two internal apps, two apps that you um, publish together, and you want those two apps to communicate with each other, or where one, one of these apps actually talk to your service. Then you make sure to sign both these apps with the same key store, you give it a signature permission, and then no other apps can talk to your service except these two because they weren't signed with the same key store. Alternatively, if it's actually a permission that the user needs to grant, you can make it a dangerous permission. So then you would need to show a permission dialog uh, which the user needs to approve. This, for example, is the case with Android's um, contact content provider. So in, in your Android app, you can query all the contacts that are stored on the Android device 
that's of course sensitive data. So Android uh, imposes a permission on that. You first of all need to um, show that permission dialog. So the user says, yes, I want to uh, grant access to my contacts to this app. But as I said, all that is covered in a lot of detail in a practical manner in the new Android Internals course. Down below, early bird discount just for seven days until Sunday this week when this uh, video comes online. I hope these security best practices help you uh, to maybe spot one or another uh, issues in your app's code. If so, definitely let me know that down below. And other than that, thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye bye.